So welcome to TD Cultural Lab Curator Conversation with Shannon Anderson and Lisa Jane Arvine. My name is Jacqueline Mack and I am the Creator Director and Strategist of the Mississauga Arts Council. This webinar is part of our TD Cultural Lab Professional Development webinar series presented by Mississauga Arts Council and sponsored by TD Bank Group. The Mississauga Arts Council is a registered charity dedicated to fostering the growth of the arts sector by cultivating creative opportunities and connections between artists and residents of Mississauga and beyond. MAC is dedicated to providing service-based programming to artists, funding artist-led programs, and growing awareness of the arts to build a vibrant and thriving cultural community. The Mississauga Arts Council acknowledges that the land on which we gather is part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the huron wendat and Wyandotte Nations. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and give our respect to these peoples and their ancestors who have been inhabitants and caretakers of this land since time immemorial. We also recognize that Mississauga is now home to many global indigenous peoples. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Jane Irvine and Shannon Anderson. All right. Take it away. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Welcome, Shannon. Looking forward to our chat tonight. Yes. Hi, Lisa. So um, I thought what we would do is we would each uh, introduce ourselves, just to give everybody an idea of who we are. Um, my name is Lisa Jane Irvine. I'm a visual artist here in the city of Mississauga. Um, I studied art and art history through uh, the University of Toronto and Sheridan and, and went on to get a bachelor degree in education. So my full time job is teaching. And during the pandemic, I decided to start a podcast where I started conversations with artists. I was missing out on that piece when we were in isolation and um, since then I've been talking to artists, makers, creators, curators. Um, along my path. And tonight I have the honor of talking with Shannon. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, my name is Shannon Anderson. I'm the curator of the Art Gallery of Mississauga. And I'd just like to thank uh, Mac for organizing this. Uh, I like the format of an interview is a lot more fun than just talking by myself. So uh, I appreciate you connecting me with Lisa and um, looking forward to chatting. I'm also a graduate of the Art and Art History program too. So we share that in common. We had a little pre-chat about some of the different uh, background details we shared. And um, yeah, and uh, from there I went on to do my master's in art history at Concordia. And, you know, we'll talk about the different kind of positions I've had that I've jumped around at, but I've been with the Art Gallery of Mississauga now for, um, I think, almost two years. I'm trying to remember. At first, I thought it was just a year, and I realized, no, I think it's been two years. So time moves fast. So great. Thanks for all of, to all of you for coming tonight and uh, looking forward. We're going to be doing a Q&A at the end as well, so there'll be lots of time for questions. So I think, Shannon, uh, just jumping off of that, I think it'd be great to start talking about your your beginnings, like how you became a curator, how that path um, came before you so that you directed yourself down that way. What were some of the things that led you there through the art and art history program? Um, I mean, I think the one of the reasons why I was interested in the art and art history program in the first place was because it had those two streams of art making and art history. I was never um, I always loved them both. I loved learning about art and art practices just as much as I liked making work. That's always been pretty consistent for me. Uh, and then I think over time, I just, you know, from there I went into, you know, looking at different galleries to work at. Um, I was always interested in being in a gallery setting. I was always really um, drawn to looking at art and um, trying to trying to engage even with contemporary art from I'd say from high school was always sort of where my main interests lie. Uh, and then I think from there, there was sort of a choice, right? Do you continue on in in the maker stream or the art history stream or where do you go from there? And and I just ended up in the uh, doing a master's in art history. There weren't a lot of curatorial, specific curatorial programs at that time, very few. Uh, and I, I wanted to study outside of the province. I had a, a 
professor from U of T who recommended, you know, don't do your master's degree in the same place, the same school where you do your undergrad, just so that you have that different kind of perspective. Um, and I just like the idea of living in Montreal. So there's a lot of different factors for that choice. Uh, and it was indeed like it was a really different kind of program and a really different education, much more um, theoretical in nature, which was which was probably which was important and needed. I mean, I think a lot of what I had studied at that time um, in art history was really um I'd say largely sort of slide identification, right? Really factual essay writing, but really not a lot of theory. It's not really the case now, but at that time when I was in the program. Um, so that did help to have that theoretical background um, supplement the learning. Uh, and then I think from there, I think pretty much from graduation, I, I started working at Oakville Galleries. I was living in Oakville and I just sort of landed there um, and just kept, kept in that sort of field of study ever since. You, you shot me back to that flashback of sitting in the dark with your slides. Yeah. You don't do that now. But it's very different. But if anybody's experienced that, you know what it's like. But um, it's actually really great. Like I, I by no means knock it. I actually found it super valuable to have all of that, like that image database in your head. Um, those points of reference that are you're forced to memorize are, are um, you know, just as valuable as any other kind of learning as, as kind of dreary and tiring as it is at the time I do I do think it works to a certain extent yeah do you think it it influences you in any way now like as you're making decisions or thinking about art that more traditional type of learning uh, I mean yeah. I think I guess you do have that database to draw from right um those reference points are kind of always a lot of them are are there I mean I did try to study a pretty wide range of histories. And I mean, even though my, my specialization is contemporary art, of course, all artists are looking at art, you know, that's not separated from art history in different kinds of areas of study. So um, it's all connected. Okay. You mentioned that uh, when you were going through, there wasn't the, the vast array of curatorial studies that there are now. So how, as a curator, do you go about finding that path? What are some of the things that you had to do or overcome or figure out along the way that sort of got you to where you are? I think it was more um, on the ground learning, like working in galleries and having that experience. I, I was really fortunate to, um, you know, work my, my first, one of my first positions after graduating or even, you know, while I was in school, going to Oakville Galleries was really formative for me. Uh, because I really uh, enjoyed the programming they were doing even before I started working there. Um, we, you know, we do class visits when you're at Sheridan. They're both in the same uh, city or same town. Um, and so I think, and the position that I had was uh, exhibition coordinator and uh, curatorial assistant. So I was, you know, sharing an office with the curator, with Marnie Fleming, um, who's a wonderful curator and really, you know, it was really just working side by side with her and coordinating all the exhibitions and managing the collection. So, um, and watching the way, you know, she met, worked with artists and the kind of programming that she was doing. Um, I was managing all the touring exhibitions that we did. So I got to know different kinds of galleries and how, how they worked. And I was doing some curating from the collection as well uh, and doing my own exhibitions. So I would say the majority of my, my training came from, from that experience. Can you talk to us a little bit about what your first curatorial experience was? Like you got to put together a show and how that Sure, yeah, I did. I, yeah, I did a, I did an exhibition called, um, I guess my, it would have been my first one, I guess it was called Revealing the Subject. And it was uh, based on the, different kinds of portraiture that was uh, in the permanent collection of Oakville Galleries. And, you know, looking at portraiture as a concept, uh, you know, some being more representative than others and the different kinds of, of portraits and what that kind of genre can be. And we did uh, applied for an Ontario Art Council grant to tour it. And so um, I traveled around the province with the show. I can't remember, I think there was about maybe three or four different venues that I went to and a lot of them were sort of small galleries so I think one of the first ones I went to I can't remember I won't say the name but when we went it was a small smaller town 
uh, space and I got there and the uh, director was also, we were, we were all expected to install the show <laughs> and I had, was so used to having an installer on site. And they're like, no, it's just going to be us putting up this show. And I thought, oh, wow. Okay. And I'm, I'm fairly handy so I could do it. But I just remember thinking with a bit of a panic that I probably shouldn't be the one hanging <laughs> these pieces, <laughs> but I figured it out. You know, we got, we got stuff up on the wall and I mean, I guess that's when, you know, making art and being used to that kind of thing is great training because yeah, I had the yeah. level out and was putting hole, drilling holes in the wall and it was a bit of a shock but it's also kind of fun right to, yeah. well it to takes the tools. experience to a different level right so it does yes yeah it was it was different for sure but it was great to be able to see you know I mean every gallery is so different in terms of how they operate uh so it's interesting to see the sort of you know the complexity of a large scale institution versus these ones where it's just you know you get in there and you get the job done mm -hmm. Um, you've also done some independent curating. How is that different from working with the galleries? Um, I mean, I think it's it can be more challenging in a way because you're, at least for, for the experiences that I've had, you're developing exhibition concepts without necessarily knowing where they're going to go uh, and hoping to find a venue. So you're developing the ideas um, usually with some venues in mind or the scale of venue in mind or the places you'd like to see the work shown. Uh, ideally, you already have a conversation in mind. I've had those experiences too, where you know which, you know, you're developing something in particular for a space and hoping, you know, you have a relationship and you're hoping that um, it will work for, for them. Um, but that that's the biggest hurdle, I think, is trying to, um, find a space that you can that you can uh, bring your exhibitions to and I think ideally as well because you're developing this concept that you know the goal is to also be able to tour it when you can um, because so much work goes into the development process and it's you know it's often for me it was often unpaid work getting to that level um, until you can actually find a, a venue to show the work unless you're you know able to get a research grant um, which sometimes can happen sometimes not uh, but then, yeah, you're not, you're just kind of putting it together as best you can until, um, until you secure a space. So when you're talking, I was just thinking, um, there was a couple of things you said. So you talked about the concept, um, maybe for anybody that hasn't worked with a curator, can you, can you talk a little bit about how you go about curating a show from say the beginning of the concept through to the hanging the actual exhibition? Um, yeah, sure. So I guess, you know, in broad strokes, um, you know, you're thinking about, so thinking, for example, if we're talking about a group show um, exhibition, um, having, I mean, the way I've always sort of worked is having um, a particular artist or um, artwork, even sometimes it's just a specific piece that I'm really drawn to and I'm interested in sort of building a conversation around that with other artworks and then seeing what direction that goes in, um, seeing what kind of pairings make sense. I think I really do think of it sometimes as a, as a conversation, right? Seeing what, what can pair in an interesting way with other pieces and then developing the idea and the thesis around it from that I think you and I talked earlier like it's really important for me to um, in my process anyway um, work with the art that I'm experiencing uh, and we're developing a concept from there uh, so studio visits come first and all those kinds of things and then once the sort of artists are chosen the concept is sort of ironed out and I'm sort of figuring out um, what particular works make sense it's really sort of a back and forth and in seeing how that all is going to come together and then usually at that stage it, it, it depends when that proposal goes out if, I'm, if we're talking about independent work then maybe earlier on before all the details are worked out it's nice to have a venue so you can think about the space and be responsive to the kind of space that you're going to be working in uh, and then from there, you know, it's about building out the text a little bit further, the ideas, refining the, the concept, 
Uh, and, you know, through all that, you're in conversation with the artists and then um, and then working with the gallery in terms of their own planning process, talking with their staff, um, their communications person, developing all that kind of material, um, floor plans, uh, how everything's going to come together, all the sort of technical needs you might have, whether or not uh, artists need to be there to install their work or not, and planning around that. And of course, through all that, you're talking about, I mean, there's also the financial uh, element as well, which is crucial to it from the early stages on um, figuring out the budget for the exhibition and what it's going to, what it's going to cost and what your needs are to realize the, the exhibition. It sounds like there's a lot involved, but people don't see behind the scenes. So what do you say is the average? And I mean, we're obviously just hypothesizing because it could be different for show to show, but what's the average span of from start to finish the, the life of that journey? I think it really varies. Um, I mean, I'm not fast with that stuff. I like to deliberate for quite a while. Um, I mean, I would say, I know, for example, when um, I do a lot of, uh, we've spoken about a lot of the collaborative work that I do with um, Jay Wilson, who I think is in the group tonight. Yes, uh, just, yeah. Okay, so we we collaborate on exhibitions and we spend a lot of time um, with the development process. And I mean, when we started working, I mean, that was also working out our own co-curating process as well. But I would, you know, in that situation, we had our first conversations and ideas about what we, what we wanted to do. And from that to when we actually had our first exhibition opening, I mean, it was like four or five years. <laughs> but that's so that's the long version of it was really because, yes. you know, there was, you know, we were both doing it. We were also both working, doing other jobs. It wasn't that like that wasn't our sole focus. Um so there's that kind of version of something that happens gradually. Uh, and then there's the version of, you know, starting to work at the Art Gallery of Mississauga and not having a lot of programming and doing a permanent collection show, you know, that was going to open four or five months away. Right. So, but I mean, with the shows that I'm working on now, it's nice to have, um, it's nice to have at least a, a year or, or so at a minimum, I think, um, to, to, from, you know, a loose concept to really sort of refining it and getting the ideas together. Uh, because you're always kind of jumping around and doing different things, right? When you're, you're, when you're curating, you're not just seeing like a show from beginning to end, and then you end, you start the next one, like you're always overlapping. So I'm working on, you know, right now I'm working on, um, the next exhibition that's coming up at the gallery next month you know, the details for that. I'm also working on the summer show. I'm working on the show in January where I'm co-curating with Jay. I'm working on a summer, you know, the the next show. I'd like to be working about five or six shows and then also thinking about what the programming is going to be in, you know, ironing out the 2026 and then it, hopefully soon into 2027 calendar. So, you know, it's a lot of, that's why it's slow, I guess, because you're not just focusing on that project mm -hmm. you're you know it's like with any project right you're balancing a lot of different things at the same time I I think it's good that you said that because I think a lot of people look at a gallery and just see the programming right then and there not realizing behind the scenes that you're actually um, planning out the next couple of years and what's happening so it's that that's really great that you're able to share that um, there's other things involved too, I'm sure, like grant writing and you mentioned finances. Um, yeah. How does that work with your role as a curator? Well, I, I think that does have a lot to do with the long term planning too, because usually for um, most of the major grants, you have to plan your, your three years in advance. That's how the grant structure works when you're applying for funding. It's a multi year grant. So you're, you're applying, you know, you're saying what you've done, what you have this year, and then the next year and the next year is usually sort of the minimum. So that's why so many galleries say, well, we've already planned out until if it's 2024, you're usually thinking about 2026 and 2027. Um, if you're a bigger institution, then probably even further out, um, which is good. And I mean, things change though too, right? Like it's not carved in stone once you've sorted out what the programming needs are. Um, but 
it's also because there, there's a process to it. It's not a bad idea to be planning far in advance. But, you know, the, the drawback is you also want to be when you're the priorities for programming it are you also want to be developing exhibitions that make sense to your audiences and um, that are relevant, socially relevant, politically re relevant, that have those kind of dynamics to them for a lot of exhibitions. And that's hard to do three years out, right? <laughs> Um, like for example, um, when one of the shows that, um, Jay and I just wrapped up, which is the poster behind me, the further apart things seem, um, we started doing the concept for that, uh, before COVID mm -hmm. and then everything changed, right? We had some money for a research grant and then COVID hit and all of a sudden all our studio visits and travel we had applied for started happening over Zoom. And it just so happened that the concepts that we were looking at um, made more, even more sense in light of COVID and social justice issues and different kinds of political things that were happening. We got lucky in some ways that those ideas still resonated with what we were thinking about, um, but we refined things as we went too because you wanted because the climate had changed, the you know the world was changing, and there was different priorities, and people were thinking about different things and. And so there has to be a certain malleability in the way that you're programming too. You actually just asked, answered one of the questions I was gonna ask you. I was gonna ask about how COVID impacted the whole curatorial world um, pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic because there has been such a shift. Have you found your mm -hmm. own practices are evolving and shifting with that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me was that uh, being a largely, well, being an independent curator and, you know, at the time um, doing independent curating and also curating for a hospital uh, mm -hmm. for their art collection uh, when COVID hit a lot. And I was, I was balancing a lot of things. I was also doing editing um, for galleries uh, and all of those things just sort of got put on hold. Um, so for me, it was about, uh, you know, a loss of, of, job security because all of the sort of different avenues that I had um, kind of disappeared. Uh, these mm -hmm. galleries were shut down. I couldn't get into the hospital anymore. The programming we had for there had 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 to end or be, you know, just all the work that was there had to stay up because I couldn't really go in the building. Um, so that that was a big impact. And it was it was challenging for sure. Um, and then, you know, one a, a big sort of drive for me uh, going back into working for an institution was because of that, you know, to have that sort of space and, and, and realizing how precarious that that is when you're working independently. It was definitely a shift. Yeah, that makes sense. You did just mention the hospital and I was going to ask you about that because that's a very different venue. So you do um, curating for the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. Can you talk about how that's different, say, from the public gallery or the independent spaces you've worked with? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not, so I, I was doing it. And then when I um, went to the Art Gallery of Mississauga, it was too hard to do both. So I stepped away from it. I'm doing, I helped, uh, helping out with them a little bit right now and um, temporarily, but I've kind of, I did, was there for about six years doing programming and maybe what I'll do, I just, I remember I do have some images here. So maybe I'll just share my screen so people can see the, the yeah, space here. Is that okay? Let's see. Okay. Um, Cause I think they're up first here. So that's handy. Um, right. So this is the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. If you haven't been before, um, I started working there when it was uh, not yet open to the public. It was a new building that they were constructing, um, which was uh, great in the sense that uh, it was built with uh, space for artwork in mind as part of the planning process, uh, what they called art moments. So my first you know, time working there was going through the building with hard hats and looking at a map going, okay, that's an art moment that's an art moment and <laughs> trying to figure out where we could actually put artworks. Um, and so the strategy uh, that the art council that I was working for uh, had was that they wanted to have like an exhibition of sorts. So it's through the main 
public corridors of uh, borrowed work so that we could treat it like an exhibition space, but one that was um, through, the, through the hospital corridors rather than having um, a specific exhibition space. Uh, so th these are some of the locations. So they have these display cases built. This one actually had, was actually meant for more like more traditional display. They have these hanging glass shelves in them, but we were able to just take them out and use it as, as a, a, a way to display um, more fragile pieces. This is another one of the cases, the Kim Adams work. Um, so the space really lent itself quite nicely to contemporary art. Um, this was an installation that we had in one of the, the nooks as well. Um, oh, I just have a few images, so yeah. So um, that was really fun for me. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed the experience because there's not a lot of uh, art programs in hospitals in Canada. So we, it felt like we were doing something kind of, kind of unique and interesting. And I really, you know, it's different parameters too when you're putting art in a hospital, there's different things to think about. Um, different rules around what you can and cannot show in a hospital versus uh, a museum setting. So there's those kind of um, restrictions. I was also really trying to um, bring in work that wasn't necessarily just decorative, but told mm -hmm. stories and had layers to it so that people could engage with it for, um, you know, a long period of time if they wanted to. So most of the work had um, I wrote up labels for the work that told a bit of information about the artist, told a bit of information about the work that they were looking at so that people had an opportunity to go a bit deeper with the work. Um, so I tried to do each year, we would do um, a different kind of exhibition, a different theme that we would, um, that would program and bring in different artists so that we could, and then produce a tour guide so that people could walk around and, and look at the different works and, and find where they were. Um, and that was great because it ended up being part of their rehabilitation program as well, so that people could actually take an art walk as part of their, you know, uh, healing process as well. We did some work with mental health and doing tours with their outpatient department. So it was, it was really different and interesting in that, in that regard. I have to say, uh, I had my son at Oakville Trafalgar, and it was really nice to see art <laughs> as I was in the hospital and not just the sterile walls. So it, it definitely does make a difference when you're in those spaces. So yeah, it says something about how we engage with space. So yeah, and really I think, um, you know, artists have were, you know, a lot of the work came through uh, loans from artists and the response and, and collectors too. And the response that we generally got was people really were excited about the idea of having their work in a hospital and, and having it, you know, having it outside of the museum or gallery mm -hmm. setting. And I also found that for me, cause I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes in galleries you, you get resistance to contemporary, well, that's not art and that's not art and it's not, you know, traditional and, you know, that's, you know, even photography, well, that's not really art. You still, you hear that a lot. And I, I really, what really, you know, became clear for me when I was working at the hospital is that it was so interesting for, you know, I was programming things that weren't like you saw that sort of, you know, that um, one piece in the display case is this the, by Lise Beaudry, which is this photograph that's sort of been shredded and it and it hangs, um, you know, it's a real, it's not your traditional artwork, but people were fascinated by it. And they had, you know, whenever I was there or when we were installing it, people were coming and asking questions. And and what I found was that people are actually quite open to um engaging with contemporary art when it's not inside a gallery, right? It's a lot easier when you're not inside that sort of traditional space with the sort of an intimidation of those, um, what that space brings with it. So it's not the art that's the problem, it's really this, the, the space of a lot of contemporary galleries that are intimidating. The work itself is, um, is, can be really easy for people who don't have an art background to engage with. Cause I saw all kinds of people who were super excited about what they were looking at and they didn't know what it was necessarily but they didn't care. They were just interested in learning about it. So I, I found that to be a really, a really heartening experience. I find that interesting that you say that then it makes me think that maybe we don't um, expose people enough to how to engage with those spaces like the gallery spaces. 
So how do you bring audience in and get them comfortable in a gallery setting? I think it's tricky. I mean, I think the architecture of a lot of galleries is is can be intimidating. Um, I think I think the gallery system has been working hard to um, make it easier, you know, even just from welcoming the just being welcoming when you're coming in, having different avenues for engaging with work, whether it's hands on workshops or tours or um you know, just having different ways of, of connecting. And I'm not to say that everybody feels intimidated when they were in the gallery, but you do hear that for a lot of people. Um, you know, I see a lot of people who come in to the gallery in Mississauga who haven't been, you didn't know we were there, um, you know, oh, what's this? And, and they're, it's not that people are always intimidated at all. They're just curious. Um, so I, I think there's a lot still that can be done, but I think, I think it's, I think there's a lot of work that has been happening to try to make the spaces welcoming. And I think for us, at least in Mississauga, we try to show different kinds of work from one exhibition to the next. I'm really interested in, in varying what we're showing so that um, people might see something new each time or something a little bit different, or they might relate, find a point of connection with one show, but maybe more shows in one way easier than another one, right? So you, you, cause you can't, it's impossible to, to, to please each, everybody with the, the shows that you do, right? So at least you can vary up the experiences and the different kinds of work that you're showing. Yeah, that's for sure. I don't think you could please everyone. You mentioned that um, people have had issues with say photography. I know I've heard in the past people talk about digital work how do you think, and we haven't talked about this, how do you think AI is changing that, that landscape? As a curator, are you seeing any of that coming into proposals or galleries, or is it still sort of evolving and growing as it does out there in the uh, world? I mean, I think you hear conversations about it. I don't see a lot of it filtering in just yet. I mean, you hear about people who've generated things on AI and, you know, through AI and are passing it off as their own work. Um, it's still a bit new for me in terms of what kind of impact it might have. So I'm, I'm not too sure yet. That's, that's fair. I, I yeah. know from the artist side, there's been interesting discussions and I've heard people say different ways that they're exploring it from either creating or writing or things like that. So I just yeah, I mean, I think, curious what yeah, you were I mean, thinking I think about that. It's an interesting tool. And I think there's a lot of possibilities um, that come out of it. I mean, it makes me think we, um, one of the things that I, I do with, with one of the projects that I work with, um, with Jay and I on our, on our, um on our collaborative work is we we have this book club and we've been reading books together um pretty much for as long as we've been working on exhibitions together and one of the more recent exhibitions uh, I think it's the or sorry more recent books I think it's called do you remember being born I think is the title of the book and it was about uh, a relatively famous author a fictional author um, who's asked to write a long form. Oh, she's a poet and she's asked to write a long form poem in collaboration with this company's uh, AI generating poetry generating bot. So it's about her experience of, of going through that process. And the book itself um, also incorporates some AI poetry as well. And I think that, and I, I, it was a great book and I thought it was super interesting the way it takes this notion of AI and, and pairs it with this, you know, senior poet and how she works with that, with that algorithm and tries to understand what the, the, the poetry bot is trying to do and how they can possibly work together. And um, I think as a, like, I'm not, um, I'm not, I mean, it, it's the, the AI is here, so it's not something that's scary to me, but I'm curious to see what, what the potential is for it as a, as a tool. Yeah, because I think I, ultimately I mean, that's what it is, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's uh, interesting to see how it's evolving, even just in the short period of time that it's been here. Um, if you were to give advice to a young and up and coming curator, what what kind what would be the best advice that you would offer them? Um, well, it's a hard one. I know. It's a hard <laughs> There's one. probably a lot. <laughs> I mean, I think. I think it's important to 
to, you know, maybe, maybe there's different, there's lots of different ways to go about curating. I don't think there's only one way to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't think you necessarily have to propose, oh, Jay says, he says what the exhibition is, AI. Shawn Michaels, do you remember being born as the title of that book? Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> great book. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think you can, a lot of, you know, up and coming curators, they rent spaces and do exhibitions. You don't have to do them in a formal gallery setting. You can just, I mean, I'm not a great example of having done that. I've always kind of done them for different settings, but I see a lot of, you know, emerging curators finding different kinds of spaces to do, to do programming. Um, I think, you know, I find collaborating super, um, super helpful too, like being able to work with someone else and tag teaming on projects. Um, I know one of the pieces of advice that I was given as a student, um, as an artist was, you know, find other people to collaborate with and generate your own exhibitions. And I don't see why you can't do that as a curator too, like be part of, potentially be part of a collective and then you can combine your resources and, and maybe do more than you could on your own. Um, can be super helpful too. So yeah. Are there skills that you think people should develop along the way as they're working towards being a curator? I mean, obviously, if as an artist, there's technical skills I would focus on, but from the curatorial perspective, if if you're thinking of taking that on, like what kind of skills do you think would help people? Um, I mean, I think the skills are pretty diverse. I think, I mean, I think writing skills are important, you know, obviously being able to articulate your ideas in a way um, that translate the experience of what the artwork is trying to convey and the different ideas it generates in you to be able to convey that to lots of different kinds of audiences who have different varying degrees of familiarity with, with art and art speak, I guess. Um, so being able to be agile in the way that you write about work, I think is, is quite important. Um, I think speaking about work is important too. I do think public, uh, public speaking is quite, it does end up being quite important. You do have to do quite a bit of these kinds of talks and things and, and tours, um, especially now that, uh, doing things online is easier. You're, um, you know, you're asked to do them fairly regularly. So I think it is helpful to be able to learn to feel comfortable public speaking um, is something that maybe wouldn't be obviously taught. I don't know, maybe it is taught in public <laughs> in curatorial programs, but I do think it's helpful. Um, you know, and then all the things that would probably come along with a curatorial program, like critical thinking is really important, being able to articulate your ideas. Um, just working with people. I mean, I think artists, as a curator, you're, you're stepping into a relationship with all the artists that you work with. Um, so communication skills, I think are really important too, that you're, um, you know, that you can sit down in a studio visit and, and get into their work and being able to converse with artists. Um, artists are all different. Some are a lot, speak a lot more um, openly about their work than others. So um, feeling comfortable working with artists and, and wanting to generate those relationships, I think is, is an important skill to have. And what are those studio tours like? Like, what do you look for? What do you, um, what are the conversations that you're having with artists? Are you guiding them in their work or are you just more collecting information? It's more about asking questions and, and, getting a sense I mean you can go on an artist's website and see the kind of work they do um but I think it's super valuable to get to meet them um ask questions about the way that they're thinking give your own thoughts about your perspective on things I think it's really just a conversation I'm not too interested really in guiding artists in the development of, of their work um, I mean, there have been times where, you know, if the question is asked, I might give my feedback on, on certain things. Um, certainly if I'm, if I'm curating their work in a show, um, I'm going to have ideas about what work I think, well, in any show, whether it's a solo show or a group show, small or large, you'll, you'll bring ideas about what you think, um, resonate 
better together than other kinds, you know, wh where you want to see the focus of things go and, and articulate that. Um, and it's a bit of a back and forth to mm -hmm. an artist, you know, so you want to make sure that they're happy with the, what you're showing of their work. Um, but you're, you know, it's also both ways. You also want to be able to pick work that, that you think reson will resonate for the particular kind of situation that you're curating. If you think back to when you were starting as a curator and you look at where you are now, how do you think your curatorial practice has evolved or changed? Thinking of like your early work versus some of the work you're doing now. Mm, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I think, I mean, I think at least within working for the Art Gallery of Mississauga, like the way I curate in different scenarios changes, I guess that's one, maybe not, it's an indirect answer to your question. Um, like the way I would curate for the hospital is very, is quite different from the kind of projects that I do when I'm collaborating with Jay. It's different from the projects that I'm going to be doing at the Art Gallery of Mississauga or the way, you know, when I'm envisioning programming, just because I'm always balancing different kinds of priorities. Um, you know, work, working for an institution now, I'm always thinking about not just the particular exhibition that I'm working on, but how that's going to resonate with the show that came before and what came after and like people who come repeatedly, like what's that experience going to be like from one show to another for them? Um, am I... And I'm always thinking about the audiences to, okay, um, you know, have I created work or created exhibitions that are responsive to, you know, who, who am I thinking about when I'm curating these different exhibitions? Am I being sensitive to the different needs of our community um, is something that I think about a lot. Whereas in the hospital, I'm thinking about, you know, balancing different kinds of, you know, the, okay, this, you know, I want to balance, I have some painting, I want to balance some, a little bit of installation or some sculptural work to give people a different kind of experience. Is that work um, uplifting, right? For people? Is it, is it, is it too dark? What kind of impression is it going to have on the public? Like those are the kinds of things. So I think maybe my long <laughs> answer to your question is, I, I think I'm learning to, I'm not thinking so much about myself. I'm thinking about, um, I'm not often thinking about just what I'm interested in. I think I always have to be interested in whatever I'm curating, but I'm always thinking about um, like what kind of experience am I creating for the artists that I'm working with, for the audiences, um, the other people that I'm working with. So I think I'm taking maybe a bit more as I, the more I do it, the more holistically I'm trying to work, not so much for the fact of trying to please people, but um, trying to be thoughtful about all those different things that come into play. And then how do you manage that? Like if you, I'm just thinking, I mean, you could take 10 people into a gallery and have 10 different reactions to the work. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it could be on a spectrum, I'm sure of like, I love it to absolutely hate it. So how do you, how do you navigate that as a curator? I mean, you're not going to obviously please everybody, but what kind of conversations do you have when you're, you're having those opposite spectrum reactions? Well, I think that's why it's important that anything I curate, I have to be really interested in, in like independent, like that I have to feel like it, it, it's really strong work in my mind of what is strong mm -hmm. and engaging so that I can talk about it. I can't control people's reaction to it, but I can share my reasons for bringing the work there, why I think it's engaging and interesting. Um, I don't think it's, you know, it, it, people will be triggered by work for all different kinds of reasons. I, I want to not put out work that's deliberately upsetting for somebody. That doesn't, isn't something I would aim to do. Um, but yeah, I think as long as the work, um, as long as I've thought things through and taken the time, then, you know, all you can really do is, is, and, and learn from those experiences too. Right. And I, I think it's important to hear why people are upset about, it. it's not that those reactions are wrong in any way. I think they're completely legitimate. Um, and you're always learning too. Maybe there's things in work that you hadn't considered that, that could be upsetting for somebody. Right. Yeah, that's true. Especially in the changing landscape we have now. I mean, there's so many different things that are evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
a lot of balancing, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> so um, if you were to, and this, this is just, if you were to dream out your biggest dream, what would it be as a curator? Like, it doesn't have to be a specific artist, or maybe it is, or a place, or what would, what would that dream be as a curator to do? Oh, those questions are, I'm so terrible <laughs> at answering those kind of questions. I don't know. I mean, it would be really fun to do an exhibit. I've never done an exhibition for like a really prominent institution. I'd love to have that experience. Like, I mean, like, I mean, prominent is in like your Met or your moment, like something, yeah. something at a really big scale to be able to feel out what that whole process is like, no matter what the work would be, would be, um, you know, to work with, a, a, you know, a, yeah, work at that kind of scale even if it was a one one off kind of experience, I think would be really fascinating just to see how different it would be. Yeah. You mentioned that you've done touring exhibitions. So maybe that's your opportunity. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> For anybody that's not familiar with how a touring exhibition works, can you just give a little bit of context around that? We mentioned it, I know a little while ago, but I think it's it's a good point as a curator. Like, how do you get it? What do you do? Who's involved? Yeah, um, well, maybe I can show some images again, too, if that's okay. Um, let me just go down because, I mean, some of the shows that Jay and I did together have have toured. And I think, so, for example, the first one we did together was called The Clo Closer Together Things Are. And that, that toured to the University of Waterloo Art Gallery, the Owens Art Gallery, uh, St. Mary's, and Southern Alberta Art Gallery. And that's our, that's our ad. Um, and so we, so for that show, I think we started with the University of Waterloo Art Gallery as a venue and then other kind of, you know, you, we, we had a package that we would send to different galleries that we thought would be an interesting fit for the show. And we just like put it out to as many people as we could. And eventually, you know, one signed on and then another signed on and we ended up, um, with four galleries. And even though the the artists were the same from show to show, um, obviously the way that we laid out the exhibition in each space was a little bit different. Sometimes the works would change slightly. Um, this uh, image is, an, is a piece that was made by Rhonda Wepler and Trevor Mahofsky. And it actually changed from venue to venue. They added a new line these are like um, almost like castings of objects made out of different kinds of foil and each venue they would they would come and create another uh, another line of casting so by the time it got to the third venue there was three of these lines which was which was really fantastic um and then the actually the sorry i'm just going to go back there was a, a site specific piece as well the one that's on the poster was um a collaboration with uh, between Michael Lex here and Dave Diamond, where they worked with the local uh, newspaper and and had images in each venue, and that 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 intervention in the local paper uh, changed, you know, depending on where we were showing the the project, and it would come out like I think you can see an image there um, in the middle on to the to the side of that project. Um, yeah, and so the relationships as as the layout changed and the kind and we were responsive to the kind of spaces that we were working at in um, the way we you know the way you put different kinds of works together in relation it would change slightly like the kind of conversations that would happen between work um, every space was a little bit different that way. Is there anything that surprised you as you work through that process? Is it like in terms of how the works look together, how they interacted, maybe the um, physical constraints. Yeah. yeah, I think um I think it was just interesting to see the different kinds of relationships or you know pairings that you didn't think might work well together um would just bring out different ideas in the work that you hadn't really saw until you actually see them in place. Mm -hmm. Um I can also show so the next project we did the further apart things seem the first venue that we showed that exhibition at was um, in contemporary Calgary, what's called the Ring Gallery, which is like a, a circle that go like the, literally the shape of a ring that goes around its planetarium. Okay. And so the way that we had to conceive the show in that space, the only way it would really work for us is that each um, 
each artist kind of had their own section as it worked its way around the ring, mm -hmm. um, which was really great. This is uh, Anna Benta Diallo's work. And then when we were able to bring it to the University of Waterloo Art Gallery, we were actually able to put the works in dialogue. And it was really interesting to do that when we had only been able to see them as separate um, gatherings of work. Mm -hmm. And then this is when it came to the Art Gallery of Mississauga. Again, it was a different kind of um, space and we were able to sort of put the works in relation in a different way. And it was just different, but um, I think it's it's uh, it just lets you explore your thesis a little bit more and how the works interact mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you're working on a couple of things coming up at the gallery. Would you like to speak to any of those at this time or? Sure, um, I'll share my screen one more time. <laughs> this is all going in order, Lisa, and we didn't even plan I, we this. Didn't this plan is kind that. of amazing. Oh, <laughs> I thought I'd be jumping around this PowerPoint presentation and it's like completely in order. This is the book club that we were talking about earlier. That's the only thing that's out of order. Um, and these are just some past exhibitions. The permanent collection show, I think I mentioned earlier that I pulled together fairly quickly. Um, and this is a, a solo exhibition of Joran Charlton's work that I did uh, not too long after I started working at the gallery. And then upcoming um, is actually a touring exhibition that I had generated as an independent curator that um, we're bringing to the Art Gallery of Mississauga, which is a, an exhibition called Undergrowth, which is the work of Sarah Angelucci. And this is an image of the exhibition at the Varley Art Gallery in Markham. And it was actually initially a, um, took its first form was a smaller exhibition at Spau Gallery in Ottawa. I just had an image from that. Um, and then it, it started with the Art Gallery of Sudbury, who was, which was the originating institution. And they, um, that came with uh, funding as a co-publisher for a book of Sarah's work. Uh, which was a really exciting project for us to work on um, working and we we managed to find a publisher for the book as well um, to co-publish with the gallery so that we would have distribution so the tour has has a book with it as well of Sarah's work um, and yeah so all of this will be this is the upcoming and the last uh, venue for for the touring exhibition and that will be opening in uh, next month at the gallery so we're just working on finessing all the details there's going to be a few things that are new to the gallery at the art gallery of Mississauga where um, Sarah's been really great about um, wanting each venue to sort of emphasize something a little bit different so we have some uh, new things that we haven't uh, that are just being created specifically for the Mississauga venue so I'm really excited about that and then uh, in the summer, the show after that is a three person uh, group show called Across Latitudes and it features work by Sohaila Esfahani and Zinnia Nakfi and Heidi McKenzie. And it's looking at experiences of migration specifically in relationship to cultural commodification and um, tour tourism in particular. Great. There we go. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Shannon. I think we we have five minutes to spare. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add or if we should just jump into questions. No, and no my slides are done now. <laughs> it worked out well. So maybe we can get Jacqueline to jump back in at this sure. point to help us with the q yes. section. Definitely. So at this point, I will invite um, those to unmute themselves or even share their screen and jump in any time um, to ask questions. And if you're uncomfortable, please feel free to type it in the chat. We do have one by Gloria Pazan. Um, I do apologize because I pronounced her last name wrong. Uh, the question is, how important is it to you to help sell an artist's work or is it just more important to get their work out to an audience? I mean, for me, I've always worked in the sort of charitable nonprofit field. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience in commercial work. I think it's great when an artist is, you know, when someone is interested in purchasing someone's work. Uh, I'm really just interested in getting the work out there. If it results in sales for them, that's great. Um, but it's, um, 
yeah, <laughs> that's sort of my focus. Mm -hmm. um, Lydia, is there? A, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, I think you're. This is a silly question, I know, but an important one, uh, especially if you are putting together an exhibit. How do you come up with such unique names? You mean like the exhibition names? Yes. Yeah. Uh, trial and error. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's just brainstorming. I don't. I don't know. I don't have a strategy. Um, I think it's just playing around with a lot of different ideas until you land on something you're happy with. I know that's terrible, but um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you think they're input? interesting, though. <laughs> Does, do or your artists have any input with that, Shannon, or is it mostly coming from the curatorial side? Um, usually from the curatorial side. I will say, though, that when Jay and I were working on the Close Together things are, it was Michael Lex here who came up with the title, if I remember right, and who was one of the artists in the show. We were doing a studio visit, and he said it in passing, like, so quickly, and we thought, I think that's right. I hope I haven't misremembered, but that's my memory of it. And I thought that's a great title. And then um, when we were doing the further part thing, seem that just came and it was like a bookend to their show. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how we landed on that one, um, but yeah, that was that. The first one was from an artist, which was fantastic. Um, but usually they've come from just from thinking about the ideas in the show and what you're trying, what the sort of main impetus is behind it. And undergrowth for Sarah's show, I think we just kicked around a lot of titles until we landed on that one. I have another question. Sure. Um, you seem to have a, uh, your hand in a, a lot of uh, different places and you, you seem to have a whole stable of artists. How do you come up with a group of artists? Um, a lot of research, uh, seeing a lot of exhibitions, um, you know, reading about shows, seeing, you know, online different things that, that come up, uh, just being, you know, looking at work all the time, really. Um, and then just noting the things that are intriguing, the things that you can't, you know, the work that you can't stop thinking about. Uh, those are, those are kind of, and then, you know, I think, you kind of have a wish list or certain artists that you are interested in. It's just about finding the right context or the timing for them. Or you start thinking about an idea in a group show. I know we, I've had this experience in the, in the shows that Jay and I have collaborated on. There's an artist who like you really wanted to include in the, in the group exhibition, but as it started to develop, it just didn't really fit anymore. Didn't really make sense, but you'd still really love the work. And then so in our case, like a subsequent exhibition is and it actually starts with that artist and you rebuild it, right? Interesting, thank you. Sure. We have Hi, Sharon. Chris. Yeah. Hi, Sharon. I'm sorry, I came in late. I apologize for missing basically the first half. And my apologies if this has already been covered in that early portion. Same sort of question as the previous one, but from the opposite side. Let's say you're a group of artists and you want to have a curator work with you uh, uh, to put together a, a curated show uh, drawn from several different artists. How, um, how would you suggest finding a, a potential curator? Would you go to the BFA or MFA programs? and get a student or, um, you know, um, at the emergence, merging mid-level artists level. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I mean, I think, um, yeah, looking at different curatorial programs could be an interesting way to start. I like that idea. Um, and then maybe just thinking about the kind of work that the artists are doing and then seeing if you know if there's a nice if there's a match if there's some curators who are who are you've seen doing programs that are kinds of work that kind of resonate with the work you're doing then that might be the art the curator to approach right is there um sorry if, if i can ask a follow-up question is yeah. there 
from your perspective as a curator, if you were being approached by artists to put together a show, is there certain um, concerns or issues you might want to identify at the beginning of the process uh, that are, would be important from a curator's perspective? You know, you, you don't want sort of a, a canned package. Uh, I'm assuming the curator would want the freedom in to, to select and to approach it the way he or she might wish. Um, so is there something as an artist approaching the curator uh, that we could kind of address, like what would we need to be aware of? I'm sorry, that's kind of a rambling question, but it's I'm not trying a rambling to get question. to- Yeah, I think it maybe, maybe it's about making the group's intentions clear, maybe. Because, I mean, when the artists are already selected and you're choosing work, it doesn't give you a lot, of, like, to be honest, it doesn't give you a lot of freedom as a curator, right? Because probably all the artists want to be represented, which is fine. So it's just about being clear about that. Well, we want to have, you know, like, are you just helping them to organize the show? Or how, how much of a creative hand are you letting the curator have, right? And that you don't have to, like, I, I think maybe you just want someone to coordinate. Maybe you've already chosen the work, right? Um, I think it's just about being clear about what your desires are and what you really want the curator there for. What's, what, what do you need from the curator in that situation? If you've already got your artists, um, are you looking just to have a venue? Do you need the curator? Like what, you know, do you know what I mean? Do you need mm -hmm. them to just sort of choose the strongest work? Um, I think that that role can vary and be more hands on or less hands on. But, um, you know, if, if it depends how much control you want to have and just being clear about that up front, I think, so that you get the most out of it because you're the one approaching them in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry if I, if I follow, one more follow up on that then. Hey. Um, it, I would. Is it then true the more freedom you provide the curator to accept or reject the group of the artists that might want to participate and how he or she might construct the the subject the 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 lens of how that art would be viewed the stronger that case is for the show would is that is that a a, a logical extension Necessarily, I think it's just if you're bringing a curator on to do to organize something or be involved, it's just a different kind of of um, level of engagement for the curator, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we have E. Connie Munson. Yeah, following up with some of what Chris has been asking about, I'm also curious if it's something that you can ask for a number of things that a curator might be able to either take over the reins of or work with with a group of people and this would be anything from um i guess different locations where an exhibit could be possible help with traveling so that it's not just x amount of time in one place only also uh, working with the theme and looking for any help with funding. That's a lot. Yeah. Of, that's a lot of asks. <laughs> and it I, is a lot of asks. You might yeah. need to have a budget to go with it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's you're asking a curator a and you're asking them to do what is a largely a promotional and an administrative role. Um, you know, that's a job. I think at a certain point. Yeah, it is. Well, it is. It is. I've been doing that for a few years. Yeah. <laughs> volunteering, but realizing there's only so many hours in the day. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The energy time things becomes uh, very, well, very seductive. It's very exciting when the synergy is pulling more and more things together. However, I still have to sleep. <laughs> And it's also it's great for learning on your feet, but it's also really great to think about, well, what would it be like to approach someone who is an experienced curator? And, I, and I'm working with one who's been guiding me because she's been 
the lead adjudicator mm -hmm. for the few years. But again, you know, thinking about next steps, next levels, I, I get very curious about that because the call to submit, when I had put it out on Akimbo this year, it was like a 56% increase over what it had been the previous two years, which is yeah. great. Yeah. And it's yeah. from, it's from across the country. And, and so that's really exciting, but you really want to represent people in the best possible light with, and, and I like to do event driven marketing. I like there to be multiple reasons for people to come back into a gallery and to see the show, not just here's the opening. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I guess um, we are kind of thinking already for next year and we haven't gotten to this year yet. <laughs> it's about five or six weeks away. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I, I think um, like Chris's initial idea of approaching, you know, a, 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 an emerging, you know, curator or an arts administrator, even for something like yeah, that. It is, it is administrative to a large degree and, and that might not be a bad fit to give someone the experience of organizing something like that can be great first experience for someone. Like you want both sides to benefit from it, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I really yeah. like Yeah, okay, thank yeah. you very much. Sure. I actually have a question for Shannon. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I do get emails from um, the the general public and an artist and they reach out to Mississauga Arts Council and asking about, hi, can you represent me or can I exhibit thinking that we are our gallery of Mississauga? And um, I get a lot of those emails. And sometimes I have to reply and say, well, technically we're not part of AGM and we're not part of the city of Mississauga. But the guidance I say I could share with them is um, visit galleries, make that connection and um, do your research. I feel like that's the best starting point. I, I and and I would say, you know, we do have, you know, micro grants or, you know, um, do your research and find out if if there are opportunities where you can put a show together that you can curate. Sometimes you need to take actions into your own hands because there's only so much curators can do because at the end of the day it is a business and there are so many things that you have to adhere to so that is all I can really do to 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 put in an email but if there's any tips that you could tell me to even guide them better please share with me because I just don't know where to begin it's hard right it is really it is a challenge I think the one thing I, I do that I'm grateful that we do at the gallery that I think is helpful for a lot of artists is we do have a juried show mm -hmm. every year so that yes, the opportunities are limited for showing at the gallery, but you can always apply to the juried show. And that, especially for emerging artists, that can be a great way to get noticed and, and start showing work. And there's so many juried show opportunities. There's prizes involved. You know, you're, having a lot of, you know, you're having different jurors see your work. And, um, you know, I wouldn't underestimate the impression that that can have on people. Like we had at our last jury show, we had a high school student who showed for the first time. Her work was fantastic. And so many people came in and were just like, this, this piece is like, it really had an impression. It was just one piece by a student. Um, so I, I, I think that's a great venue for people um, wanting to get their work out there too. Mm -hmm. But I think all of your suggestions are also um, super valid and good too. I think that's really good to to um, put that in my email and say, you know, look up for jury shows. Akimbo is a great place for that. I think there are a couple yeah. of calls right now that just gone out. I think it's one lots of Lots all the time, yeah. Yeah, lots. Um, and Gloria says, Pizan Gallery in Mississauga offers a commercial space and offers guidance to emerging and established artists. Well, thank you so much, Gloria. <laughs> we'll definitely be putting um, this in our um, creative space. Um, one of, we're launching, we're relaunching Marty's Hub. This is now called Saga Arts Hub. So that is something that I will definitely get in touch with you, Gloria. Um, it is 8.10 right now. We still have, um, you know, 20 minutes left. Um, if there's anybody else that have 
have questions, by all means, please feel free to do so now. If not, I will, um, you know, uh, end this and let everyone go off <laughs> to their evening. So does anybody else have any questions? I'm just sifting through and see if there's any hands up. Okay, it looks like this will oh, be... Oh. oh, did I hear somebody? <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, um, with uh, regarding funding, um, Shannon, do you know if uh, Arts Council covers anything for cur curators as far as their... Uh, is there any? I yes. can't remember off the top of the head, uh, top of my head, whether there's any any um, folders that kind of cover what a curator does and and uh, compensating for them for a project. Um, have you encountered anything? Um, so we, we have a SNAP program right now, um, uh, uh, and through our Mississauga Arts Council and through the SNAP program is grant funding. So we will match that, um, budget. Um, there are more information on that. So, um, Chris, I actually have your email. I can yeah. send you the information or I can share that in the chat right now below so everyone can take a look. So just give me a sec while I navigate that. Sure, Jack. Uh, but I was going to uh, sort of direct this at uh, Shannon, whether in her journeys through uh, curatorial circles, uh, was she familiar with any Arts Council funding that would be available for uh, uh, getting a curator in acting in as a curator in um, a, I, an oh, art sorry, project? I thought, I thought you were talking about the Mississauga Art Council specifically. Um, no, no. Uh, you're okay. Yeah, so uh, Ontario Arts Council, I think you'd have to check what the, I think there are, there are some different kinds of uh, grant funds available. It just depends on the parameters of the project. Um, so you don't just have to, I don't know exactly which ones. Yeah. There's visual yeah, art projects. There's different kinds of research grants. Canada Council too. Um, you just have to do a bit of legwork to see um, if there are good fits there for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I just thought I'd take a stab at that. Yeah. Um, oh, and my yeah. colleague Musha just Musha Nelahani just posted that the OAC does provide funding for independent curators. We did receive like a um, a research grant for one of the exhibitions that Jay and I curated, so that the the funding stream should still be there. Mm -hmm. And the SNAP program does um, provide funding if you need for independent curators, but it just needs to answer the the, the brief very carefully. So you do want to read through the the documents. Um, this is a it's it's very open, which is fantastic. So that's something you might want to look into. Um, any anybody else? Okay, and, okay, wonderful. So, um, this really concludes the um, TD Cultural Lab. I can't thank Lisa enough for the wonderful and insightful questions, and of course to Shannon for sharing her experience. And so, I do want to let everyone know that on the eighth of April, the micro grant does close. So get your um, grants in on time. The Mississauga Arts Award nominations are due the eighteenth of April. So if you have friends or you know, family members that are artists, musicians, et cetera, please nominate them. Our next TG Cultural Lab is the 21st of April. And as always, Mac has a lot of opportunities for artists. So feel free to visit our website or sign up to our weekly email newsletter. It's completely free um, if you like to learn more. And if you want to learn more about the TD Bank Group for supporting tonight's events, but most importantly, thank you for joining us this evening. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the night. So thank you again, Lisa and Janet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank, thank you, everybody. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. Good night. Good night. Thank you.